All right, folks, we ended um, lecture last time talking about the trends in the world beef market, both from a total uh, cattle number standpoint to total beef production and total consumption. And then we worked our way into the trade agreements and some of the um, countries that affect us in the beef industry um, in terms of trade, either import or export. And the obvious ones were our neighbors to the north and the south, Canada and Mexico, respectively. Um, there's a lot of cattle that um, cross the border um, from both countries to be finished in the U.S. and, um, and slaughtered in the U.S. as well. So, um, and then we talked a little bit about what the cool issue was, country of origin labeling, and how that really fit in with the NAFTA agreement and all the controversy around it. One thing that I wanted to make sure that I pointed out in um, our trade, our trade agreements is that Korea is actually a major market for us because they take um, a lot of things that we can't use. So they take a lot of hides um, as well as byproducts. So um, some of the products that are not very popular for consumption here in the U.S., like tongue, heart, liver, intestines, um, the Koreans actually take that and um, and because they use it and consume it on a regular basis. Um, China is also going to end up being a player here at some point in time. So at the end of last year, there um, was... Uh, trade agreements starting to be enacted between China and the U.S. And from a beef industry standpoint, we're very excited about that because China's middle class continues to grow and they are wanting red meat. So um, that could be a potential really large market for our high quality beef in the U.S. because as the uh, middle class begins to grow, so does their disposable income and their willingness to pay for quality. So this is um, going to be something that's going to be evolving over the next couple of years. Uh, President Trump had been in negotiations with China in July of last year. And so the Chinese market is opening up and it's those trade agreements are going to be authored on a commodity by commodity basis. Um, and then Brazil, we talked a little bit about this in class, but um, Brazil is a large country, roughly the size of the U.S., uh, per, uh, fairly tropical, but they do have some variation in environment, but um, they still have major issues with disease like hand, foot, or foot and mouth disease um, that they need to get under control. And a lot of their cattle are going to be grass finished, but Brazil is in the process and has been for about the last five years of putting in a lot of corn and soybeans. So we could actually start to see them start doing more intensive feeding in a confined situation like our feedlots, and that would make them a greater player in the market because the quality of the beef they export could increase. All right, there we go. Apparently my keyboard's not working. Um, so this, these are just some images of uh, beef trade in the U.S. So um, again, we talk about when we import cattle, a lot of those cattle are alive and usually feeders. Um, so if they're coming from Mexico or Canada, they're coming in as uh, feeder animals. So um, anywhere between 600 and 1,000 pounds. And especially if we are importing cattle from Australia, um, they're, they're going to be coming in intact as well. So, um, actually, no, hang on. I take that back. The intact cattle coming out of Australia tend to go straight to market in Indonesia, um, and the Southeastern Asian countries. But if they're sending cattle to us, then they go through, um, they have to be castrated because we don't, um, we want to make sure that we don't have any reproductive diseases. So if you guys have ever, um, seen a border crossing station on the Mexican border. Um, they actually, as females come across, they have to be spayed. So um, that process can happen at the border. And it's a really an interesting process. They hardly ever go in vaginally anymore and do it. They actually do it through the upper abdomen. 
So these cattle that are coming in to the U.S. to be fed out, a lot of them will come in on ships, um, and we do this with even with Hawaii as well. Um, so our uh, Hawaiian producers on the Big Island and Maui um, have really large amounts of cattle that need to be finished out. So those cattle um, come over on ships, very much like we see on the left-hand side um, over here. So they're um, very strategically um, uh, placed in here. They're really tightly packed because a lot of research, um, a lot of it from Temple Grandin has shown that animals that have constant pressure on them uh, tend to stay calmer and we want to reduce stress as much as possible on those ships. And then um, they're, they're fed um, on those ships as well daily. So it, um, it just depends on how long the boat ride is. And then on the export side, we export a lot of beef, both fresh and frozen. And so those, the, the, what that looks like is that um, the, the fresh and the frozen product will go on a ship in refrigerated cargo containers or frozen cargo containers um, to other ports outside the U.S. All right, so um, in terms of beef exports, uh, this is some, some new data that uh, we can look at that compares 2015, 2016, and 2017. So all of um, these exports are measured in terms of metric tons, and, um, and they put those metric tons on a carcass weight equivalent. So over on the x-axis, this is the metric tons that are produced, and on the y-axis, these are the months of the year. And then, so then in a portion of this slide, we actually have three bars, um, 2015, 2016, and 2017. And 2017 is solid blue. So the numbers are still coming in from the latter part of 2017 right now, but we do have good solid numbers through the first two quarters of last year. So as we can see, um, our U.S. beef exports uh, started out um, fairly short in the first part of the year and then they grow towards the middle part of the year and that tends to be pretty consistent from um, year to year. So one thing to notice here is that in 2017 our exports from January through June were, um, were much higher compared to 2015 and 2016. So that's good news. That means that um, the export market is strong and that we are actually shipping a large portion of beef out of the country. And um, so that our export markets is something that as an industry we focus on. We try to build relationships with other countries. All right. So just again, one more comment in terms of our export markets. Um, again, I can't reiterate enough, our, we export beef, both uh, fresh and frozen, so um, we very rarely export live cattle. Um, so just make sure you have a good handle on that. So when we're talking our export markets, we're very much talking beef and not live cattle. As we look at uh, this graph here, this is the export markets from January to June of 2017 and 2016. And this really represents who our export markets are. So our total beef exports are um, was quite a bit higher in 2017, as we saw, saw in the previous slide. So we're exporting up to 600 million metric tons of product. Um, and those are going to a variety of countries. Our largest export market is going to be Japan. Um, they have very little area to actually grow beef. Um, and as well as other livestock species. So they import a large percentage of their food. Um, we also export a lot to South Korea. Um, and again, that's going to be off-all byproducts, tripe, liver, tongue, um, those, those commodities that we don't really eat in the U.S. on a regular basis. And then we still have a strong export market going to Mexico, um, quite a bit to Canada and Hong Kong as well. And then our other countries, um, the other two bars down here, are a combination of the rest of the world.
All right, so sorry this is a little bit blurry, but um, this was an update of the U.S. beef export and cattle market at the California Cattlemen's Convention in December. So these numbers were really current for that point in time, so they're about um, uh, two months um, dated now. But what this slide shows is the year-to-date change in beef exports. So... Um, Again, you can see that Japan is our biggest export market and they really started or they really imported a lot of beef from us in 2017. And then we also saw um, changes to the positive for South Korea, Mexico, Canada, Hong Kong and Hong Kong and Taiwan as well as some other countries. So the important thing to take away from this slide is that in 2017, all of our exports were up, none were down. So, um, and so that's really good for news for the beef industry as well. Um, just one more comment here as I'm looking at my notes. That Japanese market really exploded in 2017 for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Australian market has been very, very tight um, and with very high prices. And a lot of that is because of drought. So Australia has been going through a drought for about the last 12 months. It's not uncommon. Um, they're, they have a really extreme set of weather conditions, so it's not un, um, uncommon for them to go through 18 months of severe drought without any measurable precipitation. So as you would guess, um, severe drought limits the numbers, they disperse herds, they totally reduce stocking rates, um, and that drives the price up from a supply and demand standpoint. So the Japanese are actually turning to other markets to meet their needs, and we're um, a long-standing uh, or have a long-standing relationship with the Japanese market. 